Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's about quarter past. Um, I think we're going to be starting the final session for the day. Um, my name's Jack Scannell. I'm going to be moderating this session. It's very kind of Larry to ask me. Um, I, I came to my first Gold Lab Symposium um, year before last, and if I'm perfectly frank, uh, that was effectively polite gate crashing by Mark Feldman, um, uh, who uh, managed to get me in. Um, last year, I was invited to give a talk, and this year, I find my mo myself moderating a session. And um, I plotted a little graph, and I reckon if I come back in 2020, I'll probably be governor of Colorado. Um, <laughs> um, I'm broadly interested in biomedical innovation. I've spent a bit of my time as a real scientist. I've spent a bit of my time um, in drug and biotech investment, and I've got what I'd, I'd call a sort of keen quasi-amateur interest in, in drug discovery and biomedical innovation. Uh, and uh, I talked to Richard Barker quite a lot, uh, who presented this morning. And I, I think a couple of years ago, when both of us were particularly depressed about the failure of translation, uh, we said that basic biomedical science should, should, should ideally have three characteristics. It should be really, really interesting. It should be true. And if possible, it should be useful. And, and, and if, science, if basic biomedical science achieves any one of those, it's doing pretty well. Uh, but actually, a lot of the time, it's getting a naught out of three. Um, when I think about the next talk, it certainly seems to have at least two of them. Um, it looks really, really interesting. So it asks fundamental questions about alternative chemistries of life, right? So who who's interested in biological science, sciences wouldn't be interested to know if the RNA and DNA we have is a necessity or whether it's just one accident and evolution or the origins of life could have gone in different ways. Very, very interesting. Uh, also potentially useful, uh, most of the products of molecular biology in the biotech industry are constrained by the chemistry of the living things we have to make biotech products. There's a little bit of modification, but, it, but a broad approximation, that's true. If one could use alternative chemistries, you could make lots of things that currently the biotech industry can't make for diagnostics and therapeutics. Um, whether it's true or not, I'm absolutely not qualified to say. But I'd like, uh, with that, uh, to welcome Phil Holliger, who's now going to talk about his work. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, good. Um, so. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Harry, uh, Larry, God, nerves, um, for inviting me to this great symposium and giving me the opportunity to, um, you know, tell you a little bit about uh, the work, the work of my group in Cambridge, and um, by way of you know explanation for the you know strange title, I'd like to to start with a sort of conceptual analogy slide, and you know really you know let's just assume you were interested in how clocks work, you know, you could go about studying clocks, you know, broadly in two ways. You know, you could, you know, take clocks, take them apart, you know, look at all the little kind of uh, parts of it and how they fit together and how they function. And I think we're going through a thrilling time in, in biology where, you know, for the first time, we are beginning to have near complete sets of all the little cogs and wheels that make up these beautiful biological clockworks. And we have big data to tell us how these different, you know, you know, bits and bits and bobs kind of like fit together. But um, what I would like to argue, um, in addition to this sort of deconstructive analytical approach to to science, I think there is um, there is an equally valid approach, and you know, that would allow you to learn something maybe fundamental about how clocks work or you know biology by you know, trying to build systems to build clocks or clockworks kind of from the ground up, from, you know, from fundamental principles. And, you know, that would allow you maybe to learn something new or at least give you a fresh perspective on it. And uh, so this kind of um, constructive synthetic approach um, is, is what I'd like to tell you about. And I'd like to tell you specifically about two projects ongoing in my lab that take this approach. Now, I'd like to start with the central dogma introduced by Francis Crick in the 1970s to sort of summarize the idea that the information flow in biological systems is unidirectional from DNA into RNA and then into proteins. Um, and 
as it turned out, you know, that was actually wrong, kind of, because later what people found is that, um, you know, the information at least between DNA and RNA can be exchanged. So information can flow from DNA into RNA and then back into DNA. And um, the fact that these two, you know, genetic polymers can exchange information, that they can be interconverted, I think naturally leads to the question, you know, why just two? Kind of, you know, could there be, you know, some extra arrows onto this diagram? Or, you know, to put it more eloquently, you know, can we conceive of simple chemical alternatives to DNA and RNA that might be capable similarly of, you know, information, storage, propagation, heredity, if you want, and ev evolution? And really to do that, you need to start with having a, you know, chemical framework, you know, some alternative type of genetic material. We call these XNAs for xenonucleic acids. And then you need a writer. You need, you know, a, a polymerase, an XNA polymerase, which would actually write out, sorry, read out the information in DNA and write XNAs. And then you need a reader that would read XNA and write DNA, so an XNA reverse transcriptase. And if you, can, if you can close that loop, if you can make sort of information flow from DNA to XNA and back to DNA, you have, some, you have a replication cycle via DNA intermediate, a little bit like a retrovirus uh, replicates via a uh, DNA intermediate, then the sort of XNA sequence space, the totality of all possible you know, polymer sequences in, uh, of XNA opens up for exploration, and within it, you know, you might be able to find XNA aptamers, XNA ligands, XNA enzymes, and uh, what I'm also going to show you, you can sort of start to, a sort of Lego-type fashion, begin to construct simple, you know, nanostructures. And what we really want to do is not to do this, to do this for one single XNA, but we'd like to ideally explore just how many there are, and to do this for as many of them as possible and explore their properties. Um, now, before we even start, we need to decide, you know, what sort of XNA we want to look at. And this, this was our starting point at the time. <clears throat> we chose those two. These are called HNA and CNA. And in these, the sort of five-membered ring, which is the canonical structure in DNA and RNA, is replaced by a six-membered placeholder, cyclohexanil in CNA and anhydrohexatol. In, in, in HNA, and the reason we chose these because they have remarkable properties. Now, the first one of those is they are non-toxic, so they do not kind of kill the cell, they don't poison the natural processes of replication, transcription, translation, and that is remarkable because most modified nucleotides, DNA and RNA building blocks, are potently toxic. Uh, a great many anti-cancer drugs like Gemzar or antiviral drugs are based on variations to the scaffold. And most of these tend to interfere um, with the cellular machinery and therefore be toxic. But CNA and HNA are, if you want, orthogonal. They are sufficiently strange to the cell that they do not uh, get uh, uh, recognized by the cellular apparatus. And probably for the same reason, they're completely resistant to nuclease degradation. So you can pretty much throw the whole New England Biolabs catalog at these, and they will not succumb. I just show, shouldn't show too many gels, but I'll, I'll try. Um, so if you, um, if you look at DNA and you expose it to these, to these shredder enzymes, this is a one-minute incubation. You can see DNA you know, melts away like the snow outside, while HNA, you know, you can wait for days, kind of nothing much happens. And the same if you incubate it in serum, DNA eventually goes, you can wait weeks. And ultimately, what is important as well is that they, this, despite their orthogonality, they retain the ability to specifically base pair with uh, DNA and HNA strands. But now, as we want to make enzymes that can read and write these, obviously orthogonality becomes a problem. And that's the price we pay. Now, I'm just going to quickly explain to you what these gels look like, because I'll have to show a few of these to explain to you what we're doing. But they're really easy to understand. So in a way, a polymerase you know, a writing, is a writing enzyme. And each sort of keystroke um, shows up on the gel as a little you know, rung on the ladder. So you have a starting point, which is, a, which is a little DNA sequence. And then when the polymerase does its job, it adds little bands to it. And you can see this isn't very good. A normal polymerase would sort of shoot off the top of the slide. While if you, and we've screened a few of these polymerases, this is the best we could get. 
if you feed a, a, a you know, polymerase from biology, HNA, you can sort of do one, two, three, four, five, maybe seven, and then it's curtains and it will not go any further. So what can be done? And this is, com comes the connection to the title of the symposium. What we really like to do is to solve this problem using evolution because we subscribe to this, uh, what is called Orgel second law, you know, kind of a, one of the giants in the field. Evolution is smarter than you are, and that's really true. Um, so what we try to build is evolutionary systems that allow us to, um, you know, to engineer polymerases to do what we want them to do. And this is, you know, a, con a conceptual slide that explains, um, you know, one of these methods. We, we call this one CST for compartmentalized self-tagging. And it's conceptually really simple. It's based on a positive feedback loop whereby the polymerase, this sort of like red kind of balls here, uh, extends one of these primer oligonucleotides in such a way that it tags its own encoding gene. Um, and to keep everything together, we encapsulate these reactions into the aqueous compartments of a water and oil emulsion. Now, you all, you, you all encounter emulsions in your daily life. M mayonnaise, kind of skin cream, these are like little oil droplets suspended in a water phase. Now, this is very similar, it's just the inverse. So these are little water droplets in, uh, dispersed in a aqueous, in a sort of, in an inert oil phase. And what is nice is you can easily make, you know, mixtures of maybe 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 of these little droplets suspended in oil, and they all behave like little artificial cells or little, you know, uh, reaction tubes, kind of, if you want. And in these, in these little bubbles, kind of what happens is, you know, the red polymerase, let's say this is the one we want, it can extend that primer, and that will, you know, sort of glue itself onto the plasmid in, uh, containing the polymerase gene, and that allows us to purify uh, that polymerase gene away from the others. The blue one can't do it, so we'll lose this one. And once you solve the, uh, technical, the technical problems how to do this, you know, we very quickly arrived at this. So now we have um, expanded the central dogma, so we can have information encoded in DNA. We can uh, move it into HNA with the a with an HNA polymerase, and then back to to DNA with an HNA reverse transcriptase. And you know, just to show you a few more gels. So the laddering is gone now. Now it just sips all the way to the end. And once we've managed to do that for HNA, we managed to do it for CNA and for a number of others. These are arabino sugars rather than ribofuranose. TNA is an interesting one, so this is a tetrose instead of a pentose. Um, and, you know, you can, you can do interlocked rings, kind of some of you may, might have encountered these in biotechnological applications. And there's actually a number more that you can do. And what you can also do um, is, is you actually learn something about how polymerases recognize uh, their substrates, how they, how they know they're making DNA or RNA or not. Um, because surprisingly, what we find is that the mutations, they do not occur in the active site. The mutations that enable XNA synthesis, they actually cluster in each of these cases in a slightly different way at the apex of the polymerase enzymes where the newly synthesized strand exits the polymerase. So this must encode some sort of post-synthetic checkpoint where the polymerase has a, has a one last look at what it's made uh, before it sort of sends it out. Um, and, um, you know, how exactly this works um, is a story for another day. So I'd like to continue now with exploring the XNA space using, you know, really a modification of Larry's great Celex process. You can now make XNA aftermers um, with sort of, you know, decent affinities. But what's important, these are now completely um, uh, biostable, so you can't digest them, you know, with any nuclease in the body. So that might be important. You can also build XNA enzymes. So this is an example of one. This is an XNA RNA in the nuclease. The XNA strand is shown in sort of red here, orange, the RNA strand in, in black, and you can see this cuts uh, the RNA at a defined position. You can also assemble simple nanostructures like polyhedra. So it, we build the tetrahedron. They're too small to see in X, uh, in, in, in um, electron microscopy, but if you attach little nanogold particles to the vertices of the pyramid and you tilt the imaging plane, you can see uh, the tetrahedral geometry. And if you build something a lot bigger like this octahedron, you can actually see them directly. 
and, and build a structural model. And just to show you that these things are really tough and potentially, um, you know, you know, really kind of suitable for applications, you know, you know, way beyond simple biological assays. So this shows the binding curves of two of these aptamers that we've made against two different targets. This is the association rate and the dissociation rate. And I don't know if you can see it, uh, but it's really sort of two curves overlaid, uh, a drawn out line and a dashed line. And one is before and after a three hour exposure at pH one at 40 degrees followed by pH nine. And trust me, there's nothing left of DNA if you do that to, to DNA, while these really nothing much changes. So they're completely impervious to this you know, harsh treatment. Um, okay, so I'd like to summarize the first part uh, of my talk. Um, I think one of the important results of this, and this sort of little family picture kind of actually incomplete by now, of, of this work is that it shows that really that DNA and RNA are not unique. That at least in, this, in the limited way we've explored so far, uh, information storage and propagation and evolution you know, can be implemented in a, probably a finite range, but a large number uh, of, of um, uh, you know, such synthetic genetic polymers. And that evolution is really an emergent property of these. And some of these, you know, some of these are and some of these are not orthogonal to the natural apparatus, but I think there's a real opportunity to maybe reinvade biology with some of these chemistries to set up, if you want, a genetic enclave uh, within the cell to control uh, cellular behavior this way. There's also um, biotechnological applications. Um, you know, clearly we can expand the chemistry of nucleic acid polymers and we can make ligands, we can make enzymes and build nanotechnology structures. And I think the way I see this field developing, this is really just the beginning. So we have been able to show new backbones. Obviously, you know, Larry's done amazing work kind of adding chemical groups to the basis. Um, some people have been able to de develop, you know, new base pairs, expanding the genetic alphabet. And I think there will be a whole, I think there will be a whole field kind of growing uh, out of these, you know, initial efforts, kind of of a, you know, exploration of, you know, sequence encoded, you know, polymers with really, you know, which can be tailor-made kind of like for any applications by simply choosing the right chemistry for what you want and then applying the power of evolution to, you know, you know get you what you want. Okay, now for the second part of my talk, I'd like to return to the central dogma. <coughs> now, one of the things that you, um, that you see when you look at this is that you have nucleic acids here at the top, and you need those to make proteins via the ribosome. But really, in present-day biology, you then need proteins to make the, to make the nucleic acids again. So how do, you, how do you start a system like that? How, how do you boot up life? Um, it's a classic chicken and egg problem. Now, about over 40 years ago, now Francis Crick, Leslie Orgel, and Carl Ruse um, proposed what at the time seemed a really far-fetched idea, but which I think in the meantime, there has been really striking, compelling, if circumstantial evidence has accumulated that there's really something to it. And the idea they had is that our biology was preceded by a more primitive primordial biology which lacked both DNA and proteins, but was based on RNA alone, both as a genetic material and also as the you know, catalytic engines for metabolism, et cetera, et cetera. And this has been, you know, become known as the RNA world hypothesis. And you know, there's, a no, there's a number of indications, sort of, if you want, fossils in, in present day biology, molecular fossils, which hint to that. And it really, the, the structure of the ribosome, the sort of giant, macromolecular machine at the heart of all cells, which is mainly made from RNA, I think is the smoking gun. And at the heart of this RNA world hypothesis is, is, is really this idea that RNA would also have been replicating itself. And really this is you know, a conceptually wonderful idea how life could get started, because if you think about it, really what, what is biology? Biology really is simply chemistry plus information. So unlike chemical reactions, which keep going on the same way all over again, 
there is progress in biology because biology has found a way to remember what's worked and hand that on to the next generation. So really the origin of life boils down to the origin of information. And this is an idea of how information you know, found a way to bootstrap, it, to bootstrap its way uh, sort of out of the you know, soup. And I can't really put it better than Walter Gilbert, and I'm just going to read it. You know, sort of the idea is that you start with an RNA polymer that somehow acquires the capacity for self-replication and mutation, and hence evolution towards ever more efficient self-replication. And that really gets the ball rolling. Um, <clears throat> there is just one problem. While you know, we found you know, amazing types of RNAs in biology, you know, self-splicing introns, RNA ligases, RNA nucleases, even the ribosome, the peptidyl transferase is a ribosome, but we've never found a self-replicating RNA. So it presumably has been subsumed into some structure we no longer recognize, or it may simply have been lost in time. So how do, we, how do we study the system that we no longer have? Well, again, I would argue, I think a synthetic approach is attractive because if we can build a modern day, you know, if you want molecular doppelganger, we'll be able to study, um, um, to study the system in a way by proxy. And, and also it obviously is a, would be, if we can do it, it's a critical test of these ideas regarding the RNA world. Now, the best starting point um, is this, you know, amazing ribosome discovered in Dave Bartel's lab at the Whitehead. And it's 200 nucleotides long, and it still sometimes blows my mind that something so simple, uh, you know, can carry out such a sophisticated molecular function. At 200, 200 letters, if you think of it, it's a little bit longer than, you know, your Twitter message. And it's really difficult to say something important and profound uh, with that few, that few letters, but this, you know, uh, this RNA has the capability to read out the sequence of an RNA strand and synthesize uh, the accurate complement. And that's shown here. You can see the little ladder, sort of it ladders up happily until it goes to about 14 and then it stops. It's quite slow, it takes a day to do that. And after it's done that, it's spent, you know, it will not go any further. So it's a good starting point, but we clearly don't have self-replication. And when we started this, the ribosome is a little bit over 200 uh, letters long. What we set ourselves, the minimal goal would be to acquire, to, to, to engineer, to evolve this RNA for it to be able to acquire the ability to synthesize RNAs, you know, at least as big as itself. And again, we take, you know, evolution to, to help us do that. Now, I know this is a complicated slide, but fear not, I'll take you through it. It's really very simple. So you start with little micron beads, and you attach to each bead um, the DNA sequence that actually encodes you know, your ribosome of choice. And a little, you know, this sort of black squiggle here is sort of the way we're gonna capture the RNA on the bead. And we encapsulate these beads within the, within the emulsion as before, in such a way that each emulsion droplet contains just a single bead. And then you carry out an RNA synthesis, a transcription, and a ligation reaction to, to, to basically make the RNA and sort of glue it back onto the bead. So when we break the emulsion and get the beads out, now each bead is covered with about 10,000 copies of this RNA. And what's important, each bead is a clone. So each bead is covered with a single type of RNA you know, multiplied by 10,000. So these clones, we know we can then stick them into a second emulsion to, you know, let them do their polymerase business. And then really the rest of the workflow, I'm not gonna explain it. This is all about converting, you know, this activity of extending an RNA primer into a fluorescent signal, which then allows us to isolate the beads and go to the next round. And once you apply that system, you quite quickly get to something like this. So this is sort of starting to look like a real polymerase. You know, we're starting to lather up, you know, quite far up the gel, approximately, you know, here, about 95 nucleotides. And, you know, to give you an analogy, you know, we're in the, close to the mountains here, and I love the mountains. Um, you know, for, for a long time, you know, sort of, you know, us and other people sort of spend their time in the foothills 
but we finally managed to sort of start to go up the mountain about halfway. So how do we get from here to here? Um, I'd like to, you know, return to something else that has always bothered me about the RNA world hypothesis. Now, I don't know how many of you, you know, work with RNA in the lab. Um, it's all very nice, you know, in your nice, clean lab environment, but really, under less clement uh, conditions, you know, RNA is not the mo world's most stable molecule. So expose it to alkaline pH, uh, metal ions, or high temperature, it really falls, you know, apart quite quickly. So if you think about it, you know, the early Earth, kind of hot boiling springs, presumably meteorites raining down, it's not the greatest place to be if you're an unstable molecule. So on the face of it, RNA is a questionable, uh, if not downright perverse choice to sort of start life. Um, so the question is, you know, what's wrong? What wrong? What's wrong with the scenario? Now, some people, actually, before I should say, even in your nice clean Eppendorf tubes, our kind of ri favorite ribozyme here is a case in point because it requires a lot of magnesium ions to function, and even at, you know, ambient temperature in a clean tube in a nice clean lab, it falls to bits in about two days. So you know, RNA, it's it's kind of a stretch to imagine this. Um, <clears throat> so, what is wrong with the scenario? Now, clearly, now some people have, you know, proposed, aha, so this is because actually RNA wasn't the first at all. There is a pre-RNA world, and that pre-RNA, whatever that was, was much more stable, and, uh, you know, eventually, you know, got converted to RNA when, you know, the conditions were better. Now, it has to be said that's possible, but there's zero evidence for that. Another approach, you know, which we have taken was to say like, well, you know, maybe we're thinking about this the wrong way. Maybe there was an environment on the early Earth where RNA actually made a lot more sense, where this instability wasn't a problem. And on the face of it, you know, the, the solution to that is, 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 is staring you in the face. What do you do in the lab and also at home when you want to preserve something that's perishable? You put it in the freezer, right? You freeze it. That, that, will, that will keep it. But what happens when you freeze an enzyme is, is in this context undesirable because when you look at, again, this is a protein polymerase now that makes RNA. If you incubate it at 37 degrees, it sort of lathers, you know, happily synthesizing RNA. But when you freeze it, it's completely dead. And that's the general rule with enzymes. You freeze them, they completely lose activity. But what's remarkable that's not true of, RNA, of the RNA of the ribozyme. When you freeze it, you know, it's a little bit slower. You have to wait a bit, but you know, it eventually, you know, will synthesize RNA almost as happily as at the optimal temperature. And if you just adjust the conditions a little bit, you know, there's something of the tortoise and the hare about it. Although it's faster at optimal temperature, it eventually be spent because it falls to pieces, as I said. While in the ice, you know, it's stable and it just is slow, but it keeps going and going and going, and eventually will actually go further than it does um, uh, at ambient temperatures. And the reason for that is that it would be wrong to think of ice as a sort of homogeneous solid medium. Um, when you freeze an aqueous solution that contains salt ions, RNA, you know, other, other chemicals, uh, what happens is the water freezes out first and all the other chemicals, the solutes, get excluded from the growing ice crystals into a liquid brine phase, so-called eutectic phase, which you can see here in this freeze fracture electron micrograph. So you can see this hexagonal ice crystal here and you can see these ridges. So this is the brine phase, the eutectic phase, which surrounds the crystals and stays liquid at sub-zero temperatures and that's where the ribozyme does its job. But it's slow. You know, it's cold, you know, it's, it's, it's slow. So it's not adapted to this environment. So what could we, what could we do to, to make it better adapted? Well, we could do evolution. So this is just the same slide as before. And really, the only thing I'll point out to you is that instead of doing a second uh, emulsion step, now we simply freeze it. So instead of enclosing our beads, in the aqueous compartments, 
of a water in all emulsion, we now enclose it into these little pockets uh, of ice eutectic phase. And when you do that, something remarkable happens. You now get one that can synthesize RNAs over 200 nucleotides long, and that's, that ribosome is 203 nucleotides long, so this is for the first time, you know, we can make something that's bigger than the ribosome itself. And to go back to my favorite mountain, you know, we're now sort of hovering a little bit above the, the summit. So let me summarize the second part uh, of my talk. So I really, I really think, you know, ice deserves consideration as a medium where RNA, you know, could have, you know, begun to, you know, to function, if you want, as a nursery, because ice really stabilizes both the ribosome structure and its activity, and in fact, you know, in increases to some degree its extension capability while maintaining fid fidelity, you know, the accuracy of replication. I haven't shown you that. What's really important as well uh, in this context is that the freezing, there's a tremendous concentration and dehydration effect going on, about 200 fold. So these reactions now can start from incredibly dilute starting conditions. And, um, um, and, and this, is, this is really why the ribosome doesn't lose activity despite the low temperature. There's also this you know, remarkable quasi-cellular quasi compartmentalization in the ice phase, you know, where, you know, like in the emulsion, like you know, there's little liquid pockets enclosed in the ice where the ribosome you know, is protected from whatever inclement conditions there would be on the outside. And as I said, you know, ice, the ice structure does support uh, evolution, yielding improved RNA polymerase ribosomes. And finally, and this was really the inspiration for trying this, the, the, the great Stanley Miller had previously shown that, you know, aspects of chemical, you know, RNA synthesis, the, synth the chemical synthesis uh, of, of RNA building blocks, and actually later, um, Diemer, Monar, and Chuck Shostak showed that these building blocks can actually assemble itself in the ice phase as well. So not only can the replication occur in the ice, but we actually get all the building blocks, if, if you want, the raw materials for RNA evolution are produced right in situ. And now what about self-replication? Are we there yet? Um, no, <laughs> because the problem unfortunately looks a little bit like this. <laughs> This is, this is drawn to scale. Um, and there's a number of really thorny problems uh, that take us from here, that we need to crack to get from here to here. Um, and, you know, we have sort of begun to make progress on, on any of these, but this one is a really hard one. Because what the, what the ribosome polymerase is good at at the moment is synthesizing RNA, you know, if you make the car analogy on a nice kind of flat highway. But it can't deal with secondary structures in the template. So it can't go through hairpins, et cetera. So it basically, there's no off-road capability built in at the moment. And there's a number of ways to, 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 um, to, 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 to attack this problem. But if you think of it, kind of one of the, one of the problems really is there is a catch-22 here because the ribosome itself, of course, needs to be a structured fold to have any activity. If it's just a string kind of swimming around, it wouldn't be an enzyme. So it needs to have a very stable fold, but at the same time, that really prevents it from being uh, easy to, to, to replicate. Now, one approach um, that we've been looking at that I'd like to explain to you in the remaining time is maybe best summarized as the sort of divide and conquer approach. Because clearly, you know, if we can't make the whole ribosome because it's too structured, maybe what we can do is we can make it in pieces and then find a way to, you know, stitch those pieces together once we've made them. And what I'm gonna tell you about is about the stitching process. Um, so can we actually assemble this thing, you know, from its pieces? So to do this, we break it into four pieces again, you know, don't worry about the details. We split it into, into four fragments. They're each roughly 50 uh, nucleotides in size. And we, we take advantage of a naturally occurring uh, ribosome that is a ligase that stitches RNA fragments together that you can also split into small pieces. And, and then, you know, you let the reaction go. And again, as before, you know, you have to freeze this. There's nothing happening when you just incubate it in solution. And you can see you can get a little bit of assembly, but if you look at this curve, 
it really, it works, but it's kind of, you know, disappointing. It's, it's very poor, kind of 3%, that's a rubbish yield. And, you know, why is that? Well, our hypothesis was this, and this is a pervasing, pervasive kind of problem, you know, in, in the whole of RNA biology. RNAs really have a tendency to not fold in the right way, and that can be a problem. And, and clearly, when you start fragmenting it into pieces, so you take these sequences out of context, the problem gets worse. But, I mean, this is a well-known problem. I just quote this from a review. Nearly every RNA whose folding has been studied has been found to adopt misfolded conformations. And I think one of the reasons is, unlike proteins, the sort of energy landscape of RNA folding is rather more shallow. So there's lots of local minim minima, and without the mechanism to sort of get the RNAs out of these local pits and sort of drive it into the correct conformation, uh, many of these molecules get trapped. Now, biology has, has obviously a way to deal with this, and there's a whole battery of what they call RNA chaperones and helicases uh, that, you know, if, if RNAs misfold, they keep unfolding them and refolding them until they, they've done the, you know, achieved the right sort of structure. But many of these are really complicated, energy ATP-dependent protein machines, so, you know, we don't have these available at the origin of life. So what can we do? Now, Potentially, you know, a simple solution would be simply heat cool this, you know, you know, melt the RNA in heat and kind of let it realign. But as I said before, like heating's really bad for the RNA. It falls to, part, falls to pieces. So what other type of, you know, mechanism could we exploit? And, and really by accident, what we discovered is that actually freeze-thaw cycling also acts as an RNA unfolding engine. And I just going to quickly show you a very simple experiment. So this is, you know, the sort of cartoon of an RNA. It has a sort of a big bulge here. And on what it, what it has attached to it, it has a quencher and a fluorophore. And in this structure, they're next to each other. So there's no fluorescence because the quencher turns off the fluorophore. Um, but if you manage to get this complementary strand to invade the structure and dissociate the, the fluorescent strand, the fluorophore will turn on. So this gives you a nice sort of fluorescent readout of what's happening to the structure. Now, if you simply incubate this at 37 degrees or at higher temperature, you know, you can see slowly, slowly kind of the fluorescence will turn on. But what we found remarkably, it just takes a single cycle of freeze-thaw freeze cycling and it turns on 100%. And, you know, I'm not going to show this in detail. You can, do, you can play exactly the same gaze with hairpin structures and all kinds of other um, structures. It's always the same result. Freeze-thaw cycling will unfold the structure. So what we needed to build is a little machine which does that for us because it's kind of tedious to sort of run backwards and forwards with the tubes. So um, we built, if you want, a sort of a cold PCR machine which will cycle our samples from about 37 degrees to minus 30 and then freeze it back and keep it at about minus 9, you know, to, to, to let the reaction going on. And once we've managed to get to, to do that, I don't know if you remember the other gel, but, you know, now we're actually getting some proper yield. So now we get about 30% yield. And what's even more beautiful, even after the first cycle, the polymerase activity of this RNA turns on immediately. So we can now get up to 30% yield of active uh, RNA polymerase ribosine driven by these free store cycles. And what that allows us to do is actually to now really fragment it into pieces that are small enough so they really have almost no secondary structure at all. So this is now fragmented into seven different pieces, and this just shows the, all the possible assembly pathways. And that looks complicated, but, you know, the real... The, the real mixture of RNAs is much worse because you need, you know, separate different, so, you know, you need different guide strands to sort of, for each of the seven ligation junctions, and actually, you know, we had to make some separate uh, uh, ligase ribozymes for some of the junctions as well. But when you put it all together, remarkably, um, they do find each other as long as you drive this forward with free store cycles, and you can see you need quite a few by now, but eventually, again, I'm just going to, you know, that's, that's really the take-home message. Eventually, you can assemble the whole ribosome from these small pieces. Okay, 
So I'd like to summarize you know, this part. So really complex ribosomes can be assembled from pools of RNAs which are really quite short, shorter than 30 you know, nucleotides long. And this sort of brings it within the range of what you know, simple prebiotic chemistry can actually produce. So I think we can you know, connect the prebiotic, um, the prebiotic sort of soups kind of, you know, of chemistry with the sort of quasi-biological activity of these uh, uh, polymerase ribosomes. The free store cycles, and, and really we, we should look into this, but we haven't yet, potentially other physio physical chemical cycles like um, wet, dry you know, cycles, uh, for example, potentially can drive such assembly. And these seem to appear to function akin to an RNA chaperone by affecting an iterative refolding and re-equilibration of the sort of kinetically trapped RNA structures and complexes until they you know, achieve uh, their proper structure. And I'd like to sort of end with making a case for ice in a, um, in a sort of you know, cosmic perspective. Now, I don't know how many of you have followed the amazing discoveries of exoplanets kind of everywhere. There seems to be pretty much um, every star kind of seems to have a planetary system. So clearly we are not alone in the cosmos, at least from the point of view of other planets. There's billions and billions of other planets. And if we think of maybe our solar system as being not untypical, I think it's worth noting that while liquid water is really rare, it's only found in any you know, quantity on Earth, ice is abundant, really ice is everywhere. There's whole celestial bodies in the outer solar system which seem to be composed mainly from water ice. And as far as free thaw cycles are concerned, they, they keep going on, at least on one planet. Okay, and I think with this, I'd like to end and thank you know, the wonderful people you know, who did all this work. Um, this is sort of Team XNA. Um, Vitor kind of built the CST selection system. Uh, Alex Taylor did the XNA aptamers, XNA enzymes, and the nanotechnology structures, and Chris Cousins helped with the reverse transcriptase uh, engineering. Aniela Wachner uh, built the, the CBT selection system for the polymerase ribosomes. Jamie, um, you know, did all the ice work, and Hannes developed the free thaw cycle assemblies. And I'd like to thank Pete Herdevine, Kevin Weeks, and Ed Norris for some great collaborations, these bodies, and in particular the MRC for funding us, and you for listening. Thank you. Well, well, I dare say with astrobiology, the origin of life, and better biotech products all in the same talk, there may be one or two questions. Uh, so um, I see a hand in the middle there, gone up very quickly. Um, the description of, of ice, there's a, a researcher at the University of Washington named Gerald Pollack who's studying the structure of water uh -huh. and proposing that there's a fourth phase of water. So I'm wondering if you're familiar with his research and if in some of the patterns that you showed uh, are similar to the patterns in, in some of his research, so. I, I, have, I have to admit, I have not you know, delved too deeply into ice research, but I know there's many different phases. I thought there's actually seven, and they depend on temperature regimes and on pressures, um, and they all kind of probably form different structures. Um, but we have really only have looked at one type of ice. Uh, Phil, really enjoyed. Um, can you take me through with your current knowledge of what you understand about cycle times, concentrations, and reaction kinetics? Um, if you go back and you mathematically model what conditions you need to get to a self-assembled uh, 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 replicating oligonucleotide, where are the major limitations in the actual process? Because I could imagine you need great preconditions, which can take a long time, but once it is there, the events thereafter, dependent on the exoplanet you're on, could, could, could precipitate much faster. That's my assumption. Have you done mathematical modeling on this, and, and how is it feasible? 
Um, I think, okay, I have no mathematical model. I'm, I'm ashamed to say that we've really not gone at this with any sort of physical chemical rigor, but really, you know, whatever works um, approach. Um, what is really difficult is that it's very hard to measure for example, concentrations in the eutectic phase. So we don't actually know what the final concentration is. We know it's a lot higher. Um, we don't even know what the final pH is because the pH actually changes as you change the temperature as well. Um, there might be all kinds of effects that happen at the in ice water interface where there might be you know, um, electrochemical gradients because some ions kind of might be absorbed into the ice while others are not and so on and so on. It's, 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 really, it's really difficult to, to, to build a model you know, when, you, when you know so little. I understand, but at times using mathematical models it could be feasible to determine whether our assumptions can be surprised by action potential signals that you might get out of that theoretical modeling. Uh, Larry, I think. So linking the two parts of your talk, uh, which were a little separate, th is there, an, is there a, a metabolic or a pre-metabolic, you know, kind of pre-bio pre bio reason for ribose to have won over the sugars that you are studying in these new gene gnomes? No, I think, I think that's a great question, and I'd, I'd love to know the answer, answer to it. I mean, I can sort of give you, give you two, two answers, two possibilities. I think one is that when you talk to you know, people who work in prebiotic chemistry, I mean, it looks like actually you know, RNA, ribo, ribose, ribonucleotides, maybe actually simply what happens under sort of earth conditions kind of, and if you have primitive atmosphere. So this, you know, it might be a simply an opportunistic choice. Um, the other possibility is that you had a number of genetic systems that started with. And at the moment, you know, we just, you know, don't know it, but uh, maybe, you know, RNA is just a tiny bit better than the others. I mean, they clearly, at the level we examined them, they seem, you know, pretty equivalent, but, you know, very small differences, you know, Every, in every cycle, you know, could make a huge difference over time. And, you know, only the winners, you know, we only, learn, we, we only know about whoever, wh wh whichever system won. Okay, I think with, oh, we'll take one more, shall we? Okay, so I was also interested in bringing them together and I wanted to know if you had tried to evolve any enzymes with your new nucleic acids? The, the, the XNAs. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe I showed this too quickly. So we actually, we, we've done a bunch of, you know, what do you call XNAs, what do you call XNAs. But I'm polymerases thinking. that are generated with them, right? Yeah. Well, okay. no, no, okay. So we've made, we've made, you know, XNAzymes that can cut and ligate RNA and also that can ligate XNAs together, but to make an actual uh, polymerase, no, right. so no that, that we haven't made because I think yet. it's kind of hard. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, with that, I think we will uh, move on to the next one. Um, but thank you very much, Phil. Thank you.